Welcome to Comic Con 2020 at home. We are here to remember Denny O'Neill uh, as our, our, our friend, mentor, uh, hero, and so much more. Uh, welcome you all of you viewers and welcome to you wonderful panelists. Uh, tell us who you are. I, I'm Larry Hama. Uh, I've been in the comic book biz about 50 years. Uh, I was an editor at both uh, DC and at Marvel. Uh, Denny was my editor on both uh, G.I. Joe, uh, Moon Knight, uh, Batman, and other titles I've probably forgotten. And pretty much everything I know about writing and editing comics, I learned from Denny and Archie Goodman. I'm editor of, over at Abrams Publishing. I head up an imprint called Abrams Comic Arts, and I was at DC for 12 years. I got to work with Denny uh, as his editor on a couple of novels, including the Nightfall novel that he did, um, and crashed in less than six months. And uh, we became friends back in, that was the end of 1993. So, um, and uh, over the years, just stayed friends. But he's he was an amazing, Amazing creator, which we'll talk about more, but, um, you know, I can't, but we're recording this a week later. It doesn't even feel like that's possible that he's been gone for a week. I am Mike Gold. I have been a professional malcontent for 70 years. I have been a friend and collaborator sometimes with Danny O'Neill for 45 years. Uh, we did a little thing called The Question in the office that we shared on a couch that at that time was, I think, just about the only couch at DC Comics. <laughs> and, uh, oh, let's see, he's, uh, he's been my mentor for 55 years, and it's still going. Uh, I'm Joseph Illich. I'm the co-managing editor for Heavy Metal Magazine, and I've been editing comic books on and off for 27 years now. My professional relationship with Denny as a mentor and as a friend started in 1998 when I became an associate editor of the Batman editorial group. So we worked together through No Man's Land, through the relaunch of the entire Batman line in the year 2000. And in that capacity, Denny and I worked closely together on the three core Batman titles, which were Detective Comics, Batman and a psychological series called Batman Gotham Knights. Hey, I'm Michael Uslin, the originator and executive producer of the Batman film franchise. I knew Denny for almost 50 years. And when I taught the world's first college accredited course on comic books at Indiana University, he was the first one to get on a plane, come out and be my guest lecturer at my course. And that began our friendship. Um, Denny, um, kind of interesting, he gave me my first job in the comic book writing arena and uh, everything I learned about graphic storytelling came from Denny, Julie Schwartz, and Alex Toth. Denny liked to point out that I was the writer of DC's The Shadow after him and I was the writer of The Question before him, the first one right after Steve Ditko, which Denny then claimed made me the George Lazenby of the comic book writing world. Uh, and, and I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Danny Fingeroff, and um, I met Denny when he came to work at Marvel, I guess in around 1980, when we thought he was incredibly old. Oh my God, he was 40. Oh my God, how could anybody get to be that old? But Denny was there and he was the wise, uh, wizened old, old guru who had you know, bounced around, who'd been up and down and over and out, and he knew more than one thing. Um, and uh, then he had the thankless task of being my editor on The Dazzler, um, which uh, I, learned, I learned a lot from, from working with him. And uh, just we stayed in touch even after uh, he left Marvel and I left Marvel, we kept in touch. And um, I'll talk more about that when we get more, more in depth, but he was, um, just a friend and a colleague and somebody uh, who I valued having in my life for, I guess it's uh, 40 years. Wow. 
Paul Levitz. I've done a lot of different things in the comic book business, but as it relates to Denny O'Neill, I go back to Denny being the editor who brought me on to Legion of Superheroes the first time wow. when I was an assistant editor at uh, DC or a two-month-old two new editor, maybe. Um, and Denny wrote a bunch of Batman for me. And then as I got larger jobs in the company, he worked for me for, I don't know, 50, 15 or 20 years um, on the team. And we played poker for five years. So, <laughs> I'm Joe Duffy. And uh, like probably everybody who's watching this panel, my relationship with Denny began when I was a comics fan. And I read his work on Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and on Batman. And I went out of my mind. I could not believe how good it was. And fast forward a couple of years, I got into the comics business. And... I met Danny and, whoa, you know, this quiet Zen master of a guy produced those intense, vibrant stories. And then eventually he wound up, uh, he replaced me as the editor on Daredevil. Uh, I had just assigned a hot new kid I had hopes for named Frank Miller to the book. And Frank came to me and said, Joe, it's Denny O'Neill. Would you deprive me of my dream collaboration? And I was like, Frank? I can't. It's going to be a wrench. But yeah, take the book to Denny. What can I do? And my reward was, uh, within a year or two, Denny became my editor on Power Man and Iron Fist, where we had a great time, and he taught me a lot, introduced me to some terrific people. Then I became Denny's editor um, on what may have been his only text column ever. He was the uh, Media View reviewer who did mostly film reviews for Epic Illustrated magazine back when <laughs> magazines had such a long lead time that by the time he, his reviews saw the light of day, the movies tended to be ready for video release. And then ultimately I uh, worked for Denny a couple of times at DC on Batman and Detective Comics. Huge thrill working with the master on the stuff that he was one of the people we'd made so great. And then I worked for him for over a year when they relaunched Catwoman. And speaking of Frank Miller, Frank Miller and Devin Grayson wanted to join us but had conflicts today. And then I am Dr. Travis Langley, professor, distinguished professor of psychology. Uh, best known, <laughs> I, got, I got promoted to distinguished. I am best known as the author of the book Batman and Psychology, A Dark and Stormy Night for which uh, Michael Uslan here wrote the forward and Denny wrote an introduction as a result of a conversation Denny and I had in the hall. <laughs> He's also helped me with several other books and we had a project we were going to do together. He stayed active his entire life and has always been a sharp, wonderful man. Tell us about your experiences uh, working with Denny. How I first met Denny O'Neill, I went to a party uh, that was thrown by Chris Claremont and Tony Isabella when they were roommates. They had a, a, a penthouse on the top of, I think it was the Dixie Hotel on 42nd Street Times. <laughs> uh, it was packed. There, was, there must have been, you know, 100 people at this party. And there was like only one couch. But nobody could sit on the couch because Denny was on the couch with some nice young blonde lady and they were like making out for the ent entire duration of the party. <laughs> I remember saying, Who who's that on the couch? And Tony said, that's Denny O'Neill. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow. Because this was, it must have been in the early 70s. And I thought, man, we're not all geeks. <laughs> <laughs> There's hope, you know. And after that, you know, I got to really know him. And, and I've worked with him on so many different projects. And, um, you know, he's, and I've, I've been through the depths with him and the heights, you know, and um, 
always managed to stick with him. Um, he's, you know, he's said a few things that I thought were really, um, you know, intrinsic about the comics business. And I, I asked him once, when I got my first editorial job, I, I, I said, hey, Denny, how do I go about doing this? You know? <laughs> and he said, the only thing you have to remember about editing comics is that it's the art of pushing immovable objects through high-speed presses. And um, I, I can't think of a better definition of, of, of the process of editing comic. Um, he was always close to my heart. Um, when I started on Batman for him, uh, DC sent me a white loose leaf binder about, you know, an inch and a half thick. And all that was in the binder was everything that Batman could no longer do. <laughs> I, How was, helpful. I, I was, you know, it was, you know uh, I guess they were trying to clean up the Batman universe or something, and like uh, get rid of the clutter, you know? So it was like, no more Batcopter, no more, you know, all that wonderful weird stuff that he used to have, you know, it was like all gone. And it was like, there's only the stuff on his utility belt and he's got a Batmobile and like, you know, the Bat Sub and the Bat, you know, Auto Gyro and the Bat this and the Bat that were all gone. You know, but they, it took a book to delineate all this. And I, I, I got really sort of nervous, you know, I called, I called Betty and I said, look, you know, they just sent me this, this book of everything I can't do, you know, and, and it's really making me uptight. Then he said, don't worry, just do what you always do. And, you know, if, if it, Anything violates anything in that book, we'll tweak it. And that was it. Uh, I, you know, I had been planning to go up to, to see him uh, in, in Noyak, uh, Nyack, and I kept putting it off. And that's a, a huge regret for me. I didn't get to see him in the last couple of months. Um, I had to live with that. I met Denny in 1993. I was hired um, as the first editor of licensed publications back there by uh, Paul Levitz and Chantal Renice, who were there. The first thing that we did was a book um, that tied into the Death and Life of Superman that Phantom Books published um, that was sort of a novelization of all the comics that were happening at the time about Superman's death, uh, and that became a bestseller. So the thought was concurrent with when with the um, with Superman coming back alive was uh, Batman Nightfall, um, and we should do a similar novel um, that we would do for, that Denny would write that would adapt all of the comics. And we did a crash course in that. It was basically start to finish a little less than five months. Um, in the middle of that process, Danny got in a car accident. Um, but we worked side by side for, I would say, three of those months, um, sitting in his, uh, in his, uh, Mary Fran bringing us, uh, you know, lemonade and cookies and, <laughs> and getting through it. Um, and I'm sure those of you who've worked with Denny as an editor know, um, besides being a great writer, he was probably the best editor that I've ever seen, but he was at first, not very happy to be edited, especially on a project like that, which had a real impossible <laughs> um, So in the beginning, he pushed back a lot and he just needed to sort of finish. We were working parallel while he was writing the next chapter, I was editing the previous chapter. Um, so, you know, what we ended up doing was once he finished everything, then we went back and we spent, you know, at least a month and a half of all that editing, all that uh, text, Anyway, the book that came out um, was going to be day and date when the Batman Nightfall thing came out. And um, 
we had this big um, sort of press conference at Hunter College to talk about what it means to be a hero. And Al Roker was there and all these people, and we got a lot of media. Uh, we went to dinner after. We were really high-fiving ourselves, the whole bat team and everybody that we pulled this off. And if the Superman book was a bestseller, then this was definitely going to be a bestseller. And I just remember going home that night, turning on the TV, and there's this white bron Bronco racing down the streets <laughs> of LA. And I called Denny, and I remember really clearly, I said, I don't, I don't think they're going to run our little Batman story anytime soon. And uh, he was very zen, which Den Denny could be. He could be the most passionate person and the most intense for somebody who is so quiet and internal. Um, but in this instance, he was very, very, he said, you know, you can only plan, but ultimately everything's, life is out of your hands. Um, um, that was the first time I ever heard the expression where he said, uh, man makes plans, but God laughs, you know? Yep. Um, for me, it was weird because I grew up, my favorite comic was Shazam. And when they relaunched Shazam, I had that first issue and it turned out he wrote, he wrote that, uh, which I have hanging up in my, my studio. And it's one of my favorite things that, that I have. But um, I remember talking to him about that and talking about the Speedy comic for Green Arrow, Green Lantern. And I said, did you know when you were writing these comics that what you were doing was really significant? And I think because he had such Catholic guilt, he could never say <laughs> that he was talented or he was good, um, you know, because otherwise it would be taken away by God. And um, so he said, all he knew was Thursday. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, um, Thursday, I would drop off my assignment, I would get paid, and then I would get another assignment. And that's what he worked hard. He was just, he was a, he was a writer and that's what he did for a living. He didn't believe in writer's block. He didn't believe in any of that stuff. You sat down, if you're a writer, you sit down and you write. And if you have a deadline, you make your deadline and you get another one. If, if, you, if you do it on time, then you'll get another assignment. And that was, that was the aesthetic. The, uh, the, uh, um, the sort of feeling that he instilled in everything that he did, but uh, he was, it was an honor to work with him. And, and, you know, it's one thing to read, to grow up reading comics and, and then to, uh, to get to meet somebody that wrote the comic, that's amazing thrill, but then to become friends with that person. And, um, you know, we talked a couple of months ago and, um, you know, he was still Denny, you know, uh, and that was just an amazing thing that, you know, we started out with this real intense, um, pressure situation of, of creating this book from nothing in, in less than five months and, uh, and becoming friends. And I'm, I'm, it's hard to believe that I won't get to have his advice going forward. I think uh, Denny got that training, that will to make those deadlines come in, pick up an assignment uh, from his journalism background in, uh, in Missouri. Uh, where, you know, you don't make your deadline, they'll publish the paper without you. And uh, I've had similar training, not to the extent that Denny had, but because uh, I worked for like weeklies. <laughs> so I had more time to screw up. But he, uh, uh, that, that training is really, really solid. And that is what he imparted to young talent was to make those deadlines. I, uh, outside of a bunch of, you know, early 70s conventions, I first met Denny in 1976 when I joined the DC Comics staff. And of course, by that point, for 10 years, I'd been one of his biggest fans. So when I get to DC in 76, I, I learned that um, not only do I work with Denny O'Neill, but I got the office next to him. <laughs> so I try to figure out what to say to introduce myself. I was on the staff of the Chicago 8 trial, this conspiracy trial. And so I, I told him how much I enjoyed the, the sort of adaptation of the trial he and, and Neil did in Green Lantern, Green Arrow. And that solidified our friendship. Um, quiet man, I think his pacifism came out of that, not the other way around. Um, uh, I think pacifists are, 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 are noble people. They're, they're, they're the people that we all want to be, but we have all this shit we have to get through before we get to that point. Kenny cut through all that, and he was there. Uh, several years later, uh, he and I found ourselves um, sharing an, uh, uh, an office at uh, one of DC's very many locations in New York. Um, <laughs> And, and we had this couch, and once a month we would sit 
down on that couch and babble for a whole day about the question. And at the end, then he says, okay, I got my beginning, I got my middle, I got my end. I'll figure out the rest. <laughs> well, okay, certainly if there's anybody in this world you can trust to do that, it would be Denny O'Neill. Um, and but what he would do is that night, he would, he would walk around uh, the Lower East Side, uh, Greenwich Village area, where he lived, and, and smoke a cigar, which he had to give up, uh, ultimately, and work out those middle points. And then he'd come back the next day, and, and like, I'd have this whole new thing. You know, I recognized the beginning and the middle and the end, but in between was magic. And I would say that, and, it, and Denny never knew how to deal with that. And I think all of us here have probably had similar experiences to that. Charlie had mentioned it just a few minutes ago. It, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just wonderful that a person that who's so good at his craft could be such a good human being. My first meeting with Denny was when I was working at Milestone Media, Denny was teaching a writing class at School of Visual Arts. And so I took that class and he was the calmest human being I had ever met in my life. And to this day may, may still be that. And then a few years later, I would end up working at DC Comics as a temp assistant editor in the Green Lantern office alongside Kevin Dooley and with some other books and all the DC editors would get together every Wednesday for their editorial meetings. We'd pass each other in the halls. So even though there were separate offices, it did feel like one community. So I would see Jordan Gorfinkel and Scott Peterson and Darren Vincenzo and like the whole crew at the time. And then for a short time, I went to work at Simon & Schuster and I came into the Batman office to visit and I went to Jordan Gorfinkel, I said, hey, I've got this 10-page Oracle story I'd really like to pitch for Batman Chronicles. And he's like, okay, that's great, but I want to talk to you about something. So we have a position open for an associate editor, and we want you to have it. So this, like, blew me off my legs. And at the time, Margaret Clark, DC alumni, was one of the top editors at Simon & Schuster. And I said, hey, Margaret, I got this problem. You, you know, you guys have been really good to me. You gave me a job, but I just got offered a job in the Batman editorial office. I don't know what to do. She said, you should run over there and take that job. <laughs> so, so I did. I did. And um, so the day I, de I met Denny, my first day in the capacity of working for him, and this is something Charlie and Paul can speak to, um, Denny's office was on 53rd Street between Broadway and Avenue of the Americas. Big windows, a lot of light. But when you went into his office, it was dark because he had the curtains drawn and there was just the lamp on his desk. And that was the only light source. And he would sit at his desk and he'd usually be reading. And he was Batman. <laughs> Mike, Mike Carlin had the office down the hall. All the light came in and had all these toys all these colors, all the DC fanfare. But you meet Denny O'Neill, and that's all you need to know because he's sitting at his desk, he's reading scripts. That's who he was. You know, he was the person always searching for the answers within story. And um, the thing about working in his office is that like, there were no dividing lines. There wasn't race, there wasn't gender, there wasn't age. There was only um, merit, right? And so when I got there, I was immediately embraced. And that era of the Batman editorial office was called Camelot. <laughs> a lot of people saw it that way. And so to be a knight in Camelot was a great honor. And when I came in, we were just kicking off this crazy one-year event called Batman No Man's Land. <laughs> and, you, and you're working with all these different writers and artists. None of the books can be late. It's a weekly event. 
and 52 parts. And I think the first thing I did my first day was I sent Bob Greenberger an email and I said, I need the biggest whiteboard <laughs> that exists <laughs> so I can make the map to chart all of this, right? And um, we all worked well together as a team. And in time, when we did the Batman relaunch, um, Denny and I would work closely together. We were co-editing Detective Comics, Batman, and Batman Gotham Knights. And the goal was to make those books have their distinctive identities again. One was a superhero comic. One was a detective comic. One was the psychological comic. And one of the things, and so Denny basically edited the stories, and then I brought in all the artists. And I wouldn't have to run anything by him because he trusted me. And that was something, speaking of what Charlie said, which is Denny hired people that he trusted. He called them known quantities. And so he hired people that he trusted, and he let them do their thing. And he did revolutionary things without even trying. It was just who he was. Like, in my time there, he hired Devin Grayson to write Batman Gotham Knights. And Devin was an amazing writer then. She's an amazing writer now. But I look since then, and a woman has not been hired to write a monthly Batman series since. And I think about how Denny was just bringing all these different voices into comics based off of skill, right? Based off of a belief that they could bring something to the world and push for the best stories. And um, so if I think about what I learned from him um, among anything, it may be that it's always about the story, right? It's never about you. You are invisible. Everyone is invisible in service of what that narrative is. And, you know, they say that um, people write themselves in their stories, in the characters they write. And um, he was Bruce Wayne, highly intelligent and contemplating. He was Oliver Queen fighting for the values of everyone. He was Victor Sage trying to figure out his place in the universe. He was all of those people. He was Tony Stark, the alcoholic who fell to the bottom and had to climb his way back up. He was all those characters he wrote. He was the best of them. I'd like to make two comments. One is a fan and one as a pro. Uh, I first became captivated with Denny O'Neill's writing in his Charlton days, uh, starting with, as Mike mentioned before, the classic black and white book, Children of Doom, but also one of the weirdest, most bizarrely insane creative things I ever read, a little strip called Wander. Mm -hmm. And when I read yes. this, which was in my hippie stage, I said, oh man, the, the comic books are going into some new territory. This is exciting. By the time Denny moved over to DC Comics, I had just gotten my driver's license. I was now seriously dating girls. And all of a sudden, my interest in comics began to wane. <laughs> and I felt that I was outgrowing comic books. When Denny started on Green Lantern, and Green Arrow, and Batman, I actually, and I'm still getting the chills now, I actually witnessed comic books growing up with me and becoming more mature and becoming more sophisticated and the level of art, the level of graphic storytelling. And, you know, Stan got the ball rolling with that, but boy, what Denny did and struck the heart of everything at that time, I was in the streets protesting with my friends uh, whether it was against the war in Vietnam or against Nixon, or it was for the environment, for women's rights, for civil rights, for the 18-year-old vote, everything that we were battling for, I felt Denny was addressing and he was conscious of. And again, never talking down to a reader ever. And um, the reason I think I have been a lifelong fan of comic books from that point on was due specifically and primarily to Denny O'Neill and his work. As a pro, I started working at DC Comics 
Paul, you, I can't believe it. It's like 48 years ago. And um, I was, Saul Harrison, vice president who had hired me, had me answering fans letters that they wrote into Batman and Superman, little kids fan letters. And I was working at DC. It was heading towards 6 p.m. one night in the summer. And I heard yelling and screaming coming from down the hall. I thought somebody was being murdered. I ran down there. It was Denny. He was in his office. He was alone. I said, well, what's the matter? Are you okay? He says, and this goes back to the deadline issue. He goes, no, I'm not okay. He goes, Carmine had canceled the shadow. And then like some new sales figures came in. And at the last minute, he reinstated the shadow. He goes, so now they put me back on that schedule. I'm supposed to have a script in tomorrow. He goes, I don't have a script for the shadow. I don't have a story for the shadow. I don't even have an idea for a story for the shadow. So being the young punk I was, I said, Denny, um, I have an idea for a shadow story. He said, you do? I said, I, I said yeah, I didn't. Uh, he said, all right, Michael, come on in, sit down, sit down. What's your idea for a shadow story? So the wheels are turning. And my girlfriend and I, now my wife, had just come back from Niagara Falls. And I said, well, Denny, since, uh, since the stories are set in the 30s and 40s, back then at Niagara Falls, people were going over the falls in barrels and they're walking across on tightropes. I said, um, my story would be the shadow battling a bad guy on a tightrope at night with searchlights going over Niagara Falls. He says, well, Michael, I love that visual. That's a great cover, but what's the story? I said, oh, well, you're gonna love this. Uh, the story is about uh, smuggling. And he goes, okay, what are they smuggling? I went, they are smuggling uh, drugs. And he said, okay, well, he goes, you need a creative take. What's the creative punch here? What's unique and different? And I'm sitting there going, well, this is the best part. I've been saving it for last. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going, well, back then, back then they were going over the falls in barrels. They're going over the Canadian side. There's a false bottom in the barrel. They're putting all the drugs in there. It gets washed up onto the American side. That's how they're getting it through. He says, now that's an original take. He goes, I like that. Can you have a full script on my desk by six o'clock tomorrow night? I said, not a problem. He said, I was now a writer for DC Comics. God bless you, Denny. Thank you so much. <laughs> what a story, right? Denny was uh, dependable. Um, if you needed him, he was there. If you know, as a lot of you know, in, in, in recent years, I've done a lot of teaching and a lot of events. And of course, you know, I'd always think, well, who the hell can I get to, you know, to teach with me or for me? Or who can I get to be on this panel? That'll draw a crowd. Oh, I'll get Denny. And, <laughs> and if you needed him, he showed up. And he would act as if, as if I was the one doing him the favor, you know, as if, you know, as if he needed the the publicity or or the or or, or whatever else of, of of showing up for my event. So he was really dependable. I don't think he was that great a driver. I've driven with him a few times, and you know, it's amazing he lasted as long as he did. Uh, we all took him for granted, right? I mean, this was a guy who was a, a star several times in this in the comics world. But we took, he didn't act like it, right? He wasn't without ego. He, he, I think he knew his worth, but he, he treated me like an equal from the day I met him. And anytime I would see Denny like quote something I said, or I remember when he gave me a draft of his novel to comment on, it was, it was like, I, I still had to pinch myself. It was like, well, here is this incredibly accomplished, well-known, uh, brilliant, person who's actually interested you know in my opinion and I don't think I was the only one I think he made everybody felt like they were his peer he never condescended you know as I'm saying he's, he wasn't without a, a healthy ego of his own um and then he was was always teaching um you know he was one of those guys what you know not just when he was teaching just whatever he said there was something to be learned from and he was and he was uh glad to learn uh from everybody and, and everything and i guess the you know the the the, l the last point i want to make is his resiliency i mean we were 
you know, I mean, we talk, you know, he was a big fan of Will Eisner and, 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 and the spirit. And I guess the spirit was famous for constantly having the shit beat out of him and then coming back. Well, then he just bounced back personally and professionally uh, again and again. And, and uh, we, you know, we all know it wasn't easy for him, uh, but it was inspirational. But it was, you know, I, I remember uh, when Erwin Hazen passed away. Erwin was 96. And yet we were all shocked because Erwin had bounced back from being almost dead like 40 times. Well, Denny, the same thing, really. I mean, when I said Denny was, Denny, you know, it wasn't just that I was in, you know, uh, much, you know, in my 20s when I met Denny and he was 40. He had a lot of hard mileage on him. So that, and, and as we've been talking about, he bounced back multiple times over the years. So when, I, when it was finally announced that he did die last week, I was like, really? He's not bouncing back? It, it, he's Denny. He's, how could he not? Um, so he beat the Reaper a lot of times. And, uh, you know, it was an honor to know him and be his colleague and his friend. I was a huge, huge fan of Denny's long before I ever met him. And then Paul mentioned poker. Well, back in the 70s, there was a Friday night poker game. Now, I am told... There is a grown-up poker game from that era that most of us did not get to go to that was, you know, the tough old guys and the serious card players. And Alan Milgram tells me he was in that game. But most of the people my age, little older, little younger, we just had a goofy, we might as well have been playing Monopoly, except that we all loved it and we all did it. And that was every Friday night so long ago that instead of poker chips, we were using dimes and it was still high finance for us. So that was all I knew about Denny. I mean, okay, here I worship the guy. He's super talented. In person, he's so incredibly chill. It's like, did they bring him over from Madame Tussauds or is this the same guy who wrote that? <laughs> and then he replaced me as Frank's editor on Daredevil, which I could totally see because at that point, A, Frank here worshiped Denny, and B, Daredevil was as close as Marvel was gonna get to, uh, to Batman, but I was meanwhile writing Power Man and Iron Fist, and you know, they threw the books up in the air, they juggled them, this editor got that, and suddenly Denny, who I'd never worked with, was my editor on the series. We already had an art team, we had a good vibe going, they were unbelievable characters who I dearly loved, and what used to really happen is, I didn't know you were supposed to sit down and you and the editor would go over your idea, I'd just go in and tell Denny what I was doing. And he was always fine with it. I was like, cool, this is great. Well, one week I went in and I was like, you know, I've got a story and I like it, but it doesn't feel like enough. He's like, what do you mean? I said, this happens, this happens, this happens. The characters are, are in character. There's a bad guy. It doesn't feel like enough. And this was Denny's teaching moment. Changed my life. I shared this with people. It, uh, it changed other writers' lives. He said, let me tell you a story about a movie I once saw. Now, Danny told me this movie was Laurel and Hardy, and it may have been, but I've never been able to find it. And I think what he may have done is pulled from several different sources to make his story good enough. And he said, okay, so they've got a piano and they're trying to move it. And it's just the two of them. And they don't have a cart and they're trying to move it. And they go upstairs and they go downstairs and everything's hard and then they get to a rope bridge in the jungle and like to move a piano he's like yeah they have to move a piano over a rope bridge in the jungle it's like okay and he's, he's got me going i am so hooked the hell with power man and iron fist i want to hear this story and he goes so they get onto it and a wind comes up and it sways and the piano lists and then it sways the other way and the piano tips the other way but they make it, they get halfway across, and then from the side they're trying to get to, a gorilla starts toward them. <laughs> he said, if your story isn't big enough yet, you've forgotten to put in the gorilla. <laughs> it was the most amazing teaching moment I have ever had in my career. And uh, I was working with Wee Simonson on something or other, I can't even tell you what, because. Weezy and I, also, there were very few of us in the Marvel offices in those days. So we all worked together. And I told her that story. And years after, if I got stuck on something, she'd just go, Joe, 
I think you forgot to put in the gorilla and we would both lose it. <laughs> and whatever else I ever worked with, with, with Danny, all the wonderful times we had, all of the fun, the best moment ever was when he told me never to forget the gorilla. I got to know Denny when I was doing the comic reader, an early one of the early fanzines, getting the information about what was coming out the next the next month in comics. And he was freelance editing for DC. The first time I think that one of the major houses let a writer edit their own material on a freelance basis. He really was a unique individual breaking through at that time. We didn't really get to know each other particularly well at that point. A few years after that, it had gotten to the point where he was coming into the office most days. I had gotten a little more responsibility and he suddenly inherited Legion of Superheroes as the editor. And he knew nothing about Legion of Superheroes. It came with Jim Shooter as the writer. Jim had been writing Legion on and off for a decade, so it really didn't matter if Denny knew anything about it. And then suddenly Jim quit to go be Archie Goodwin's associate editor at Marvel. And Denny didn't have a regular writer for the Legion. I'm not sure if I ran down the hall. I'm not sure if I killed anyone in between. <laughs> um, you put on your flying ring and zoomed down to it, Danny. There probably was blood in the hall somewhere. I'm not sure whose it was. But I was getting that assignment and no one else was getting in my way. And the thing that was most meaningful to me about that brief period of our working together, because he left staff fairly shortly, one of my real problems as an editor, which you may still notice in how, as a writer, which you may still notice in how I speak, I tend to have lengthy sentences. And my characters had very lengthy sentences. I hadn't learned the economy that you really need to write comics. And Denny took a pencil to it, but not only took a pencil to it, he tossed at me one of the textbooks on journalism, The Art of Editing the News, taught me copy editing from it. See, this is how you get the bits and pieces that really are what you need in the sentence. And you don't need these other bits and pieces that you're putting in that just connect things and that you think you need, but you really don't need. Yes, they were grammatic, more grammatically correct maybe, but we're not here doing a grammar book. We're here doing a comic book. We're do here doing fiction. Make your characters speak like people. And he cured me of a bunch of bad habits, I think in about two issues flat, besides letting me play with my favorite toys in life. Uh, we went on to be pretty good friends. We started playing poker together fairly shortly after that. I don't know whether it was the big boy game or not, Joe. I think we were still doing dimes in the process. <laughs> um, Milgram was definitely at the table most of the time. Denny was quietly sitting there, probably getting more of the cash heading to his side of the table than on average most of us were. Um, and I suspect we learned a few things along the way. He was one of the older and wiser fellows sitting at the table. What other specific remembrances stories about Denny would you want to share? Or what do you want to make sure people know about him? When you write, you reflect the popular culture that is around you, the zeitgeist in the world. And if you're really lucky, you have some effect on the zeitgeist. Most of us don't have much. Most of us, when we write, it's a ripple in a pond and maybe we run into somebody who listened to what we said and it had some effect on their life. But when you think about Denny's career and accomplishments, he was the rare writer who was very much in tune with the zeitgeist and very effective in changing it. The comics world that he came into was a very narrow world. It was still creatively shrunken from the comics code and sort of the trauma of the comics code. And Stan and some, Roy and some of the guys at Marvel were pushing against it a little bit. And here and there, there was a young writer trying a story at DC, doing something pushing against it. But 
nobody had really cracked through. And quiet Denny O'Neill, calm Denny O'Neill comes in and shouts through his stories. And Green Lantern, Green Arrow, the changes in Batman that happened almost at the same moment, change the culture. He goes on again a few years later when he's at Marvel with the demon in the bottle story to bear a little bit of his soul and change how we see superheroes. Stan had made them vulnerable, occasionally made them screw-ups, but Denny wasn't giving them a superhero problem like Spider-Man's having to sew his costume or the thing not being able to change out of being a pile of orange rocks. He was giving them a real world people problem. And it was real because it was out of his own life. When you measure what Denny did with Batman and with Iron Man, he had more of an effect on the popular culture than probably any other comic book writer other than arguably Stan himself. And in some ways, maybe more than Stan himself, because he changed the tone of the material in a way that Stan didn't. Stan created characters that went on to movies and TV, but then he changed the tone of the movies and TV. The Tim Burton movies with Batman, the Christopher Nolan movies with Batman, the Iron Man movies, all have deep, deep roots in Denny's stories, not because they used a moment out of a particular story, some of them did, but the way they viewed people, the way they viewed characters, were the way Denny viewed people and characters. That's a change in the whole culture, that's a change in the zeitgeist. He wasn't a ripple in the pond, he was a damned tsunami in the pond, and nobody did it the same way ever again. He didn't boast about that, he didn't talk about that, and he probably never tallied it up like that. Some of us take notes of you know, how many copies we sold and how many people read something and how many translations we've had in different media. He, he just wanted to write his next story. Um, but tally it up for him and you can line up the next five or 10 of us and we don't have any measure of the same effect that he had. And I think he had an effect that changed the popular culture for good because it made it more human, it made it more real, and it allowed us to bear things in the characters' souls that we weren't allowed to bear before. Denny also had this incredible ability to pull off the whole less is more trope. He and it, probably from his from his his uh, journalism background, but uh, more so, he could reduce everything down and make it explode bigger. He encapsulated all of comic book physics in one line. He said, "It might be phony science, but it's our phony science." <laughs> and the more you think about that, it's like. Yeah, that's the roadmap. That's more than just clever and true. It's the roadmap. When I first met Denny, uh, it was either 71 or 72, and he stayed at my house for uh, three nights. Um, it was the first time uh, I understood that he was, uh, he was battling a demon. And uh, over the decades, I saw some of the more brutal aspects of it. Uh, I was able to have some conversations with him about it. And the only point I want to make is this, that when you have someone who is battling a demon like that uh, and you're watching it and you're also a fan of comic books and superheroes, uh, that's kind of what my superheroes did. Um, but to see it in real life and to see what he went through and how he ultimately overcame that um, put him into the category where I put very, very few people in my life which is a real life superhero. And in many regards, he was that to me. And um, uh, it, it was amazing to watch him climb that mountain. There's a reason why the Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Speedy story has such resonance for 
so many people because that came out of his addiction and his, you know, battles and struggles and his, but also, you know, here's a guy from St. Louis who is so progressive and caught up in what was happening in social justice in the country and the world. And he wanted to address that because that was important to him. And he made sure if it was important to him, that came across in his comics. Um, and I remember once he said, you know, he kept, he referred to himself as an alcoholic. And I said, but you haven't drank in 20 years. He said, but I'm always going to be an alcoholic. That's right. And that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody say that. And he struggled with that. I talked to him for three hours, four hours, the night that Mary Fran died. I was in the office when he called to tell me that she passed. Um, but I couldn't get him off the phone and I didn't want to interrupt him and say, I got to go home. I got another 40 minutes. And he just talked. And he talked about wanting a drink at that moment, which was totally understandable. Um, but he had been really so good about not drinking. And I remember it was the first time I ever said that to said anything like this to him. But when he started talking, I said, if you can drink, I'll kill you. <laughs> um, I don't know if he ever did or not. After that, I would be surprised if he didn't because of the impact of her passing. Um, but I think that it was he wrestled with it his entire life. One of my favorite Danny stories is, uh, is that he was hired to come work at Marvel and he came into the office and he couldn't figure out why, like there was almost nobody there. Well, it was Yom Kippur. And uh, <laughs> that was the, of course this Catholic kid from St. Louis, it's Monday, <laughs> where is everybody, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just want to jump in with one thing. Uh, Denny taught me more as a teenager and guy in my young 20s at a particular era in our country uh, that was impacting the youth. He taught me more about social justice and humanity than any other writer of that day. And um, nice. his, his, his impact in that way, I can't even begin to tell you because it's part of this formula that I think we've all espoused in terms of how much actually looking back comic books impacted our own particular moral and ethical codes and Denny was a big player in that at a very very um, important moment in time when I was evolving from a kid into an adult. Really well said. Uh, Denny had this moral strength, this moral fortitude that you, you would just brush up against and feel it and it would change you, it would open up your eyes. And a lot of that came through in his writing, an awful lot of that came through in his writing. I know people who became more concerned about their environment after reading some of Danny's stuff. And I'm not saying like Green Arrow, the Green Arrow stuff or, or any one particular point in his career, all the way through. Yeah. Kids who just read his stuff for the first time five years ago, 10 years ago, have, were changed by it. And, you know, all of us, for whatever creative endeavors in which we're involved, you know, that's a, we know that that can be a heavy responsibility, a heavy burden. And Denny made it so easy. And I think that, for me, that's his greatest contribution to this planet. I was always struck by the dichotomy of Denny O'Neill, that he was so internal but then if he got up to speak or teach he was like larger than life <laughs> and i i knew other people at dc who never had a conversation with denny and um, they said they tried and he would very you know was very curt in fact there was an artist who was a big fan of denny's and i knew denny liked this artist's work and i said oh i'll introduce you and he was like oh i don't want to meet him i said no he loves your work and then when i introduced him to denny denny was like hi that was it like nothing came out and then you know and, and people always have that like oh you know he doesn't say anything but if you got him on the phone you couldn't get him off <laughs> and, and <laughs> for somebody who is so brilliant like really brilliant he could tell you everything about the dumbest tv shows and he watched every episode and he could break them down you know something like the love boat <laughs> Yeah, he would, he would know stuff, and I was always surprised that he was like this high-low, you know, quiet, but also incredibly, you know, boisterous when he had the moment. 
um, incredibly contemplative, but also really um, expressive. Um, I found that fascinating. I'm going to argue with your use of the word boisterous. I don't, <laughs> I, I, everything you described, I think, is true. But it's not that he was being boisterous. It's that he was at a pulpit. Ah, ah very good. Whether he was, whether he was teaching or preaching, <coughs> if, it, if it was a funeral, a memorial service, if it was a classroom, he had a responsibility. And he stood up at that podium and treated it as a pulpit. I yeah. am, I'm going to preach Mark Grunewald to you today. Mm. I'm going to tell you, you know, why it mattered to be Mark Grunewald and why you all should be thinking about him today. Right. Um, I'm going to talk to you about writing and your responsibility as a writer and what, what it means to be a writer and how you should think about yourself. Be and maybe, maybe part of that goes back to the Catholicism and sort of he was either, he either was either the priest or he was the parishioner. And if you were the parishioner, all you were supposed to do was sit there quietly and cross yourself and mutter yes at the right moments. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a Catholic, so I'm offering that by observation. Um, but that was, that was the dichotomy. But if you gave him the pulpit and it was his responsibility, right, he was going to yeah. preach. Yeah. yeah. Were you at the memorial for Nelson or Michael? Were, were you at the, um, that memorial when he spoke? I must have been. Yeah. I, I remember him at Grunewald's enormously vividly. I don't remember him from Nelson's, but I must have been in the room. Do you know the story? Um, have, yeah. When you talk about a pulpit, he really spoke from the heart and let everyone have it between the eyes, deservedly so. Yeah. Get that was going. a remarkable event. Yeah. Back in up with your San Paul. So, Paul, you, you might know this, Charlie, you were on a different floor, but so the editors, the DC editors always feared Wednesdays because Wednesday at three o'clock was the weekly meeting. Right. And Mike Carlin, who was the executive editor at the time, ran the meeting. And so it was always like, okay, get out with your face still on. <laughs> as long as you're making all your deadlines, you're cool. And then when you leave, you know what, you're, you, know what you have to do. That was the basic tenor. But one time, Danny co-hosted, he guest hosted the meeting. <laughs> and he talked about story. And he said, Comic books have an unlimited special effects budget. We can do anything in comic books. And he really spoke to the strength of the medium. And that meeting, we all walked out inspired to do better work. That was the difference. He always, he, the man always inspired you. And he inspired you to stand by him in any decision he made and being the group editor of batman at a time when batman was neck deep in the justice league and the different batmans there's the batman who's the solitary crime fighter and the batman with all these objects and goes all over the planet and fights aliens and stuff like that <laughs> There were conflicts every month, <laughs> every month. But um, he was always the quietest person in the room. And we always walked out of there with a solution. Yeah. Something that Danny did that nobody, I don't think anybody's ever really talked about. It is a cultural phenomenon that we've all lived with for going on 40 years. And nobody ever talks about the fact that it came from Denny, and Denny was the one who thought of it, and everybody's copied it since. And that is the wise old teacher figure who mentors the hero at his, when he reaches his crossroads. It's like now everybody's like, yeah, I know what that is, that's Yoda. And it's like, yeah, it's Yoda. And it might be that George Lucas went to the same source as Denny did for that character, 
But Denny's the one who taught it to all of us long before we saw The Empire Strikes Back. A lot of Friday nights, we would go to the Times Square area or to Chinatown to watch either samurai movies or um, kung fu movies. And the samurai movie it was The Lone Warrior and the Sword and this, this, that, and the other. But the kung fu movie was always the cocky young punk of talent gets into trouble and meets a crotchety old guy for whom he has no respect, who turns out to be the guy, the teacher, the one who knew it all, the one who teaches him all of that. And that figure was in Batman, that figure Denny and Frank together brought into Daredevil, that figure, you know, for crying out loud, it's the turtle right. and also the raccoon in the Kung Fu Panda franchise. And Denny was the one who transplanted that figure from the beloved translated Kung Fu movies of the 1970s and early 80s into being one of the core archetypes of American heroic fiction. You brought up a good memory, Joe, of uh, we went to see the uh, Samurai Trilogy, the Toshiro Mifune, directed by Kurosawa. Oh. He was playing at Film Forum. I had never seen it. He couldn't believe I had never seen it. And we show up, and it was playing all three films in a row, and then it would repeat. And when we got there, and he'd done this on purpose, we got there, and it was, part three was playing first. And you don't go see Return of the Jedi before you see Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. But he insisted that we see it that way. And I was confused. He didn't explain it. He said, well, watch it. We'll watch the second, and then we'll talk after at dinner. <laughs> what he wanted me to understand is this is what he became. And then when you go back and you see the first and the second and third, the, this first and second, everything takes on a whole new meaning because you realize that all the, all the, the, um, the sort of pure thoughts that he had, all the idealism that the samurai had, would be contradicted, but now I know that while I'm watching, because I've already seen where he ends up. And I thought that was really fascinating, and it wasn't something that I would ever think to do, that you, you know, usually you would go in order. But he, he liked the fact that you were informed by this foreknowledge of where the character ended up, so you see where they begin with the foreknowledge of where they're ultimately going, and the story took on a whole other meaning. And he was, that was something he felt really strongly about. I think we all wish we'd had one more of those long conversations with Denny, but if you could have said one more thing to him, uh, what would have been? My thought is simply, thank you, Denny. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's the best. Basically. Yeah, That's the best. Thank, thank you for you, everything. I thank you all. Uh, I thank Danny Fingeroth for helping me so much bring this together. And I thank the viewers who've put up with the, us in our ramblings for all this time. And thank you, Comic-Con. Magic reason, guys, but it was really fun seeing you all nonetheless. Take care, all, everybody. All right, everyone, have a good one. Thanks again. Thanks so Take much. Take it easy, folks. <laughs> <laughs>